We got one here. My recorder. All right, so Roosevelt runs for re-election or election uh, to uh, the office of the presidency. And I say election because, again, you've got to... He wasn't elected the first time. He, he was raised to the office because of the death of McKinley. And he runs on the campaign called the Square Deal, or sometimes just known as the Three C's. His ideas were that the government should do these three things. One, control the corporations. What does that mean? What that means is Roosevelt believed that the greatest danger to American prosperity was monopoly. He believed that if corporations had a monopoly over trade, they would be able to set prices and they would unjustly steal from the American people. So he used the federal government excuse me, to break up trusts left and right. He wanted to bring them under heavy control. He also wanted to bring their, their pollution problems under control. So very much a progressive, a big government guy when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, both the modern Republican and Democratic Party would love this part of Roosevelt. Second was consumer protection. This goes back to his reading of that book, The Jungle, by Upton Sinclair that we talked about, about the rats running across the meat in the meat packing industry in Chicago. Well, he wants to protect the consumer from all this stuff. So he pushes through the Pure Food and Drug Act. He also starts doing things like uh, trying to protect consumer from unjust railroad rates breaking up long haul versus short haul pricing for railroads. Uh, whatever he could do to try and make things fairer for the consumer. As a result, the federal government is going to expand greatly under Theodore Roosevelt. Not as much as it will under his cousin Franklin Roosevelt later on, but still it expanded more than it had under any president before him. And finally, the last one is conservation of natural resources. Theodore Roosevelt created the national park system by executive order. The national park system was not created by a vote of Congress. He just used executive order to set aside certain public lands. Now, he didn't go take lands from people. They were lands that the federal government already owned, but he set them aside as national parks and said, this land can never be uh, uh, modified. It can never be, uh, be used. There's a lot of questions whether he even had the authority to do that. I would argue that he, he didn't have the authority. But Roosevelt was so popular that he was able to do this, and nobody asked a question about it. Okay? Uh, draw comparisons to things that Reagan does later on, that Franklin Roosevelt does later on. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was this massive, bigger than life president, this force. Let's talk about Roosevelt as a trust buster. I want to talk about that word trust because for our purposes, a trust and a monopoly are the same thing. There, there's actually a little difference. A monopoly is where one business controls an industry and can set prices. A trust is where businesses cooperate to set prices and control an industry. Okay, But they're, they're the same basic concept. He wants to break up these businesses that so dominate an industry that they can cooperate among themselves through things like interlocking directorates, where uh, maybe I've got a, a steel company and you've got a coal company, and I'm going to put you on my board of directors, you're going to put me on your board of directors, and we're going to cooperate to help each other set prices, okay? Interlocking directorates. He wants to break these, these kind of trusts down. Uh, <coughs> However, he didn't think all trusts were bad. He thought there were good trusts, that there were trusts that, uh, that could set prices but, but did it in such a way uh, as to protect industry. So, uh, for instance, he broke up the Northern Securities Corporation, but he allowed U.S. Steel to, to, to stand because, in his mind, U.S. Steel kept steel prices low and was good for, the com for, for, for America while Northern Securities jacked prices up on freight uh, and in violation of, of, of the restraint of trade laws. So it's this weird situation where Roosevelt does not have a pure reading of the Constitution understanding. 
He doesn't think things are right or wrong based on what the Constitution says. He thinks things are right or wrong based on his gut instinct, and then he uses the Constitution as a tool to, uh, to, to get his instinct uh, passed. That should be pretty familiar to a lot of you if you've watched uh, politics in the last 40 years. This has become the standard now. He pushed through the Hepburn Act. The Hepburn Act, still in place today, uh, is a way of controlling railroads. Uh, he set maximum rates for railroads and allowed the government, this always bothered me, to inspect their profits for, quote, undue profit. So the federal government can come in, look at railroad companies' books, and if they thought they were making too much money, they could force them to lower their, their, uh, their rates. Um, that sounds pretty un-American to me. I will say the one place that I think this, this is okay, maybe, is because the federal government had, uh, had invested a ton of money and they were a shareholder in, in, in the, most of the railroad companies. They had given the land, they, had, they were kind of partners in this. So that kind of gives them a stake in it, maybe. Uh, but it still bothers me that the federal government was saying, no, you make too much money, we have to take that away. Um, very early, very early hints of what's to come, particularly with his cousin later on, Franklin Roosevelt. All right, so I keep mentioning all these things that, that I personally don't like about Theodore Roosevelt, but I also mentioned earlier in a previous lecture that he's one of my favorite presidents, uh, which is kind of a weird thing, how you can like somebody for some of his personal characteristics and really not like what he does. Uh, this right here is one of those examples where I have a lot of respect for him for how he dealt with something, but I'm not sure what he did was right, okay? So let's talk about Roosevelt as an imperial president. Uh, Roosevelt believed that Congress was inefficient. He was right. Congress could get nothing done. So he thought that power should be centralized in one person, and the president was that person. Where did he get this idea from? Well, he goes back quoting Andrew Jackson, who said that the president was the tribune of the people. Here's his argument. The president is the only person in the country that was voted on by all the people. Your congressman was voted on by people in your district. Your senator was voted on by people in your state. But the president was selected by all the people. So he sees that as a higher calling than the other branches. Okay? Uh, and to show the exercise of this, he would oftentimes force his will on, on, on others, on Congress or even other businessmen. I'm going to give you an example. The 1902 anthracite coal strike. And I love this story. 1902 comes along. Anthracite coal is the cheapest kind of coal there is. It's not good coal. It's poor quality. But it's what most people use to heat their homes. And remember, in 1902, that's how most people survived, was by burning coal in their house, okay? So, winter's coming on, and 140,000 coal, coal miners go on strike. They're demanding that they get a 20% pay raise, and they would like the work day reduced from 12 hours to 9 hours. So what's, their demands are pretty exorbitant. They're saying, I want to be paid 20% more, and I want to work 25% less. If, if you're a management, are you going to agree to that? That's crazy. You're demanding that, I, that, I, that, that, that you work 25% less time, and I pay you 20% more for doing it. That doesn't make sense. So they went on strike. And they know that... They're in a position of power because winter's coming. And the fact is that if they stay on strike, people are going to die. Up in the north, people are going to freeze to death without this. So Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt calls in the union on one side and the management on the other for arbitration at the White House. And I've got the image in mind because Roosevelt had broken his leg in a cross-country skiing accident. So he comes in here, he's got the, on his crutches, 
with that one leg up there in a cast, you know, and he stands over them and he tells them that you have to make a deal. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to make a deal today. I'm forcing you to make a deal. And he backs off into the dark corner and lets them argue. And they literally argued for hours. And at the end of it, neither side was willing to budge. So what can Roosevelt do? Roosevelt comes forward. And I'm paraphrasing here because we don't know exactly what he said. But this is the gist of it. He looks over at management and he says, either you reach an agreement with the workers or I'm going to nationalize the coal fields. Now, if you don't know what that means, it means I'm going to take your coal fields, just like I did the, the national parks. I'm going to take it. It's going to be owned by the U.S. government, and I'm going to make a deal with them. And the strikers cheered because he's on their side. But then he turns to the strikers and he says, and you're going to compromise or I'm going to draft all of the miners into the army and your job is going to be mining coal. And you can do it for army wages. Does he have the authority to do this? I don't know where you find it. The president does have the authority to ask Congress for, for a draft. In times of war, we weren't in times of war. The president doesn't have the right to just take your land or, or your business, though. But he says he's going to do this. And there was enough of a, of a belief in Roosevelt, and he was popular enough that they reached a compromise. He forced an arbitration, and he didn't have to do that. Now, do you think Roosevelt actually would have done this? You don't think so? I think he would have. More importantly, it seems they thought he would have, and they believed it. Okay? Uh, this is going to be an important model later on, because Theodore Roosevelt getting away with this is going to allow, in 1981, Ronald Reagan is going to do the same thing to the air traffic controllers when they went on strike right before Christmas. He said, either go back to work or I'm going to draft you. Okay? So what happens here is important. He forced arbitration. Uh, that's an example of the imperial presidency. Roosevelt is acting almost more like a king than a president. Was he wrong for doing that? Mm -mm. You don't think so? Yes. Yeah. You and I, you and I would have a political argument, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it worked. I think it, I think it, it was efficient. I think the right decision was made. I think the way he did it was criminal. Okay. So uh, the model here is kind of scary. So 1908 comes along. Roosevelt is young. Roosevelt is not yet 50 years old. And he serves two terms as president. When he ran for re-election in 1904, he had said that this was going to be my second term and I would seek no other after this. But in 1908 comes along and Roosevelt really doesn't want to step down. Again, he's not 50 years old yet. What's he going to do with the rest of his life? He's already been president, you know? But he keeps his promise. And he supports this guy on the left, William Howard Taft. Big Bill Taft. Uh, Taft was a lawyer and a judge, and he had been the military governor of the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. Um, he was a brilliant legal mind and a very good friend of Theodore Roosevelt's. And he was Roosevelt's hand-chosen replacement. The Democrats nominated the guy on the right there, William Jennings Bryan from Nebraska. William Jennings Bryan was known as the Orator of the Platte. He was a, he was a fairly young man. He, was, he wasn't 40 yet. Uh, known for giving fire and brimstone speeches and campaigning very, very hard. People loved William Jennings Bryan. But they didn't love him enough to outdo the fact that Theodore Roosevelt handpicked Taft. Taft has now been sworn in as president. 
By the way, if you don't know what Taft is most famous for, uh, at least allegedly, now there's some question if it's true or not, but uh, according to rumors of people that wrote books shortly after, Big Bill Taft was so fat he got stuck in the White House bathtub and they had to break the bathtub to get him out. Uh, that, that, that may be an apocryphal story, but that's kind of, that's a, that's a story that was told about him afterwards. Uh, pretty famous guy. I like this picture. If you see this, this is something that y'all might not recognize today because it's not a game that y'all would play. But at the turn of the century, there was a great game that everybody played. It was, it was everywhere. It had two sticks with a string between it, and it had was basically a yo-yo that, that, that sat in the middle of it. And you'd pop those sticks apart, and that string would come up, and the yo-yo would fly, and then you'd catch it. It was just a game that kids played, okay? And it had swept the nation. One of those silly, stupid things that happen that, that we can't explain why they're big, like yo-yos and those stupid uh, Japanese uh, Chinese. Chinese spinner things or Chinese finger things, whatever. Yeah. But so this is a game that was going on. Well, the problem is Taft, when he came into office, he didn't do what Roosevelt said thought he was going to do. In fact, he ends up breaking up U.S. Steel, which was a trust that Roosevelt liked. And he's not nearly as aggressive as Roosevelt. Roosevelt was not happy. So the artist has this guy, and it shows that Roosevelt has launched Taft in the air with his game. And his thing says the Taft boom. But what does the artist think is about to happen? Crushing. Yeah, that Taft is going to come back down, and he's going to damage Roosevelt. That Since Roosevelt picked him, all this stuff that Taft is going to come down, and it's going to damage Roosevelt's reputation. And it does to an extent. Roosevelt's going to fix that. So what is Taft's administration going to be like? First off, he doesn't use the gunboat diplomacy or big stick diplomacy that, that Roosevelt used. Taft comes in, and he uses what we call dollar diplomacy. Taft didn't want to, to, to be a bully. He didn't want to park our gunboats outside places. He thought the best way to make friends with a nation was to invest American money in business in their country. So he would uh, act as an ambassador and send American business down to invest and help these economies. Is that a good way to, 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 to run, run a, a country? Yes. It works. Both of these ways work. Gunboat diplomacy works. You can scare the crap out of a country into doing what you want to. It worked great for Roosevelt. Or you can invest your money in it. That also works great. But they're different. And Roosevelt did not like this idea. Roosevelt thought we should be uh, negotiating from a place of force. And because Taft doesn't do that, he seems indecisive. Now, you've got to realize that Theodore Roosevelt was like the poster child for ADD. They didn't know what ADD was back then, but anybody would have seemed indecisive after Theodore Roosevelt. If somebody breathed wrong with Theodore Roosevelt, he didn't even question it. He just bombed them. He just sent in, sent in the Marines immediately. It didn't bother him a bit. There was decisions were made very, very quickly. Taft is making decisions, but he's not doesn't seem to be acting as fast. He's also in a bad place where he's following a super, super popular president. And I've mentioned this before. If any of you are interested in politics, never, ever, ever uh, run for election after a popular person because you're going to be measured against them. You want to go into office after a disaster, okay? Well, he went into office after a very popular person, and he's just not going to be as popular. As a result, by 1910, when the midterm elections come up, the Republicans are convinced that Taft is a liability. And that he's not only not going to be able to win the presidency, he's going to cost them control of Congress. And cost them control of state legislatures. So what do you do? Well, they get in contact with Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt left. He left the country after he made Taft, after Taft became president because he wanted to give Taft room to be his own man. 
and he went on a on a year and a half long safari in Africa where he he shot everything he could find. Okay, well he's out there in Africa and he's getting the newspapers, so he knows that people are sending it to him. He knows what's going on, but then he starts getting these telegrams and these messages saying, "You got to come back and save us. Taft is destroying the party and destroying the nation. You have to save us." And Roosevelt's got all of that on the back of his mind. So, here's a great cartoon. Uh, the cartoons were so good back then for editorial cartoons. Of a picture of Taft. And what they're doing here is they're comparing Taft with Roosevelt, whether you realize it or not. Remember, Roosevelt had that famous saying, walk softly and carry a big stick and you'll go far. Big stick diplomacy. Well, this guy... Instead of carrying a big stick, he's carrying a big pen, and he's writing checks. Okay? So, what do you think the artist is, that thinks about this guy? Is that a positive or a negative view? Um, it kind of seems like cocky, kind of. I, I, I think it's kind of a positive view. The people are cheering yeah. him, and they're, they're calling out the difference here. Look, Taft is doing this without killing people. He's doing it with a pen, okay? What does it say on the pen? It says conservation. Conservation. Oh, no, sorry, conservatism. Conservatism. So uh, that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we wouldn't call that conservative today at all, but it was considered to be very conservative back then. So Big Bill Taft is, is going to be challenged. What are we going to do? Well, enter the new bull moose. Theodore Roosevelt returns. And he announces that he is going to run for the Republican nomination. He is going to challenge the sitting president for the Republican nomination. Now remember, Theodore Roosevelt is the most popular person in the country. But Taft is the president. And it's hard to defeat an incumbent. So he comes in and he doesn't really look like the same old Roosevelt. He's put a lot of weight on. He doesn't look real healthy, in fact. And one of the reporters asked him about it, Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. President, are you okay? And he responds, I feel as healthy as a bull moose. So they start calling him the bull moose. Okay, that kind of becomes his nickname at this point. And he gives these speeches. He, he travels around the country. And everywhere he goes, thousands of people show up to hear the former president speak. He has bigger crowds than Taft does. But when time comes to vote in the primaries, he does well, but he doesn't do enough to win. Taft wins the Republican primary. And at the convention, they find this out. There's a last minute effort at the convention to ignore the primary vote and draft Roosevelt instead. Doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well. Primaries are really rigged towards an incumbent because you get to pick your uh, you get to pick who runs the show. If it goes to the convention, which this one did, if it goes to the convention, most of the delegates were chosen by the president. So Taft kind of got to stack the, the delegation with his own people. And Taft gets the nomination. <clears throat> Roosevelt is furious. Instead of being a good sport and, and, and like we always see and, and shaking hands and recognizing that he lost. He leads a walkout from the convention. And they go form their own party. It's the Progressive Party, which is going to be nicknamed the Bull Moose Party, built around Theodore Roosevelt. And his new platform is the New Nationalism. Theodore Roosevelt argues that there should be a minimum wage, but only for women and children. It, Still doesn't believe there should be a minimum wage for anybody else. But women and children, in order to protect them, there should be a minimum wage. I think he's wrong, but that was his belief. He also believed in workers' insurance. What that is, that's like unemployment insurance. If you get laid off, there will be something there for you. Uh, corporations, he wanted to bring all corporations under complete federal control. That's pretty scary. That's... That's, a, a, that's kind of viewing down the road at what's going to happen with communism. 
in other countries. And an end to dangerous child labor. It just says end to child labor up there. They weren't going to stop your kids from having a paper, paper route or something. But they didn't want kids working in factories anymore. Okay? The pretty popular, uh, pretty popular platform. Look at this cartoon up here. I don't know if y'all can see what that is. But that big bull moose has Theodore Roosevelt's face on it. Okay? And it says, the latest arrival at the political zoo. And behind him, there's a little bitty donkey that looks very weak. And then there's an elephant with a patch over its eye that looks like it's beat up. That's the Republicans and the Democrats, while Roosevelt looks powerful. Uh, the new animal looks like it might be able to do something. Okay? Roosevelt might have been okay. In a general election, I think Roosevelt beats Taft. If Taft wasn't there, Roosevelt wins the whole election. But a new person shows up. This guy, Thomas Woodrow Wilson. Dr. Wilson. By the way, this shows you how much we respect education in this country. He's the only doctor we have ever elected to the office of the president. Uh, now, he wasn't a, a medical doctor. He, was a, he, he had a doctor of education uh, in history. He was a history professor. Um, Dr. Wilson was governor of New Jersey, uh, but he was originally from Virginia. He was a Southern sympathizer. He had been president of Princeton, and he had a lot of respect for Theodore Roosevelt. So much so that if you look at his platform, it looks like Roosevelt's platform. He calls his the new freedom. That sounds familiar. And he calls for a breakup of monopolies. And look at that next one. Uh, he opposed laws that grant special privileges to women, children, and minorities. That's where he's going to going to bring himself off. He says that Roosevelt is making special laws for special classes of people. I oppose that. I think everybody should be treated the same. By the way, he could have added, except for blacks, because he was an incredible racist. But he doesn't add that at this point. Okay? Dr. Wilson runs. And the progressives are confused. Because Roosevelt was the first progressive president. But Wilson's a progressive, and he's a Democrat. So you have a conservative, Taft, and two progressives running. So as a political scientist, I look at this and I go, well, will the progressives divide their vote and the conservative win? But then I look at it and I go, except the conservative is a Republican and one of the progressives used to be a Republican. Are the Republicans going to divide and the Democrat win? It's hard to understand what, what, what's going to happen here. It's a guess. This is how it turns out. 1912, Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, gets 435 electoral votes. Theodore Roosevelt, an independent, gets 88 electoral votes. Taft, the sitting president, the incumbent Republican president, got eight votes. And Eugene Debs, who was a socialist, an admitted socialist, uh, like Bernie Sanders was for a while. Uh, he didn't get any electoral votes, but he did get 6% of the popular vote. So you look at this, and you realize something weird happened. 1912, on paper, should have been a Republican landslide year. The president was a Republican. The economy was good. Going into it, the Republicans controlled Congress and most of the state legislatures. This was supposed to be a landslide Republican year. But instead, a Democrat wins the presidency, and the Democrats got control of both houses of Congress. What happened? Well, what happened was Theodore Roosevelt. When Theodore Roosevelt walked out of the Republican Party, 
and founded an independent party. You had a strange system where an independent party for the first time had enough strength to swing an election because of the power of the person that was running, but not enough strength to win. So a lot of those Republican voters, instead of staying home and voting for the Republican, they split and they voted for Roosevelt. And even more important, it was the lowest Republican vote out turnout in history to that time because a lot of them were confused. There were two Republicans running for president and they just stayed home. The Democrats didn't. If people stay home, this is what happens. Draw a comparison to 1992 when Ross Perot ran a third party candidate, strong third party candidate, and Republicans stayed home instead of voting for George W or George H. W. Bush. Bill Clinton got elected. Uh, you almost got to say that this this last year when a lot of Republicans voted for Gary Johnson instead of for uh, for Donald Trump. And Trump still won, but it was it was it was a similar election where the personality of one was able to sway an election. And, and in some states it did sway it. Some states it, it, it swayed it from Republicans to Democrats. So very similar things happening here in nineteen twelve. All right. That gets us through this. Uh, we will pick up here on next Monday. I will try and get your quizzes out today. If I don't, it'll be out tomorrow, okay? Uh, if anybody was out, let them know that I'll post the, uh, I'll post the lecture recording up on Blackboard today. Y'all have a good day, and I will see you later. Did the Socialist Party make it to the debate stage in the next cycle?